Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Corbridge. I'm the head of the School's Development Studies Institute, DESTIN, and I'll be your chair for this evening's lecture in the School's Space for Thought lecture series. Now, this series brings together outstanding speakers from across the world to help inaugurate the building in which we're sitting tonight, the new academic building at the LSE. And the lecture series enjoys financial support from friends and alumni of the school through its annual fund. Uh, for those of you with strong interests in global development issues and in international political economy, which I guess is everybody here tonight, this has been a particular bumper and very exciting term within the spaces of thought framework. In April, we heard from Professor Paul Collier of Oxford University on the topic of wars, guns, and votes. And next month, in July, uh, we'll be hearing from Professor Amartya Sen from Harvard University, who will be speaking on the topic of his new book, The Idea of Justice. And tonight, of course, very happily, we're here to listen to Professor Danny Roderick, also of Harvard University, talking to us on the topic of Capitalism 3.0. Now, just before I introduce Danny more formally, a couple of quick housekeeping issues, if I may. Please make sure that your mobile phones and any other thing that might be irritating is now turned off. Uh, secondly, Danny will speak probably for around 45 minutes. We'll then have questions. Uh, I'll be selecting people probably in a, groups of about three. Put up your hand at that time. A microphone will come to you. Please, there are a lot of people here tonight. There's also an overspill lecture theatre, which is taking a video cast of Danny's talk. Please keep your comments, please keep your questions in the form of questions, uh, not long comments. Make them short and sharp. Now let me turn to our speaker tonight. Uh, Professor Danny Roderick is the Rafiq Hariri Professor of International Political Economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Danny's work is at the forefront of research on what constitutes good economic policy and why some governments are better than others in adopting it. Some of my own students, Danny, know you as Mr. Institutions <laughs> or as Mr. Context. And there's a great deal of respect for the nuanced and elegant way that you've sought to refocus development policy debates around place-based analytical narratives and specific development bottlenecks. Most students of development will know you perhaps most of all for the way that you've challenged one-size-fits-all approaches to development policy of the sort perhaps that were pioneered by the likes of Ann Kruger and others at the IMF and the World Bank. But they'll also know you and your colleagues for the very vital challenge that you've presented to the work of Jeffrey Sachs on the alleged importance of bad geography and the associated view that development problems, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, are best approached through large-scale infrastructural projects and healthcare spending, rather than through concerted institutional change and the hard work of building pro-poor political coalitions. Needless to add, uh, Professor Roderick is very widely published in all of the leading economics and development journals. His book from 1997, has globalization gone too far, question mark, was also listed as one of the most important books of the 1990s by Business Week. Danny has affiliations to the National Bureau of Economic Research in the US and to the Center for Economic Policy Research in Europe, which I think is based here in London. Uh, like our own Robert Wade, he is a past winner of the Lientiev Prize for advancing the frontiers of economic thought and in 2007, he was awarded the inaugural Albert O. Hirschman Prize of the Social Science Research Council in the US. That seems to me to be a marvelous person to be linked to, and it's a very well-deserved prize for Professor Roderick to win. So it is a very great pleasure to welcome you, Danny, to the LSE tonight to talk to us about new mutations within capitalism and how we might imagine a better balance between markets and their supporting institutions at the global level. That at any rate is what I assume you're going to be talking to us about under the heading of capitalism 
Thank you very much, Stuart, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. It, it's really nice to be here. I've, I've always had a, a soft spot for, for the LSC, and uh, I've, I've, uh, any, every time I, I've, I've come here to give a talk, I, I've been overwhelmed by the, uh, the warmth um, of the audience as well as the, uh, the sharpness of the uh, intellectual challenges. So it's, it's always a, a pleasure uh, to be here amongst you. So I, I look. Uh, forward in particular to the, uh, to the exchange part and the discussion part and the question, question and answer part. Let me begin with a little bit of an apology um, and it concerns the title. Um, I, I must admit that uh, Capitalism 3.0 is, 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 a, is um, a too cute by half even by my standards um, and uh, um, I don't know what ever possessed me to come up with this title except that <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, the staff here uh, were pressing me for some title and that was, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a testament to the uh, degree of organization here at LSC quite some time in advance and I had actually no idea what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it seemed like capitalism 3.0 sort of was, uh, was okay and then I got stuck with it um, and, 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 and that's, that's what you have. Um, it, it's sort of, um, uh, I think, the, um, makes me makes me seem a little bit like a Tom Friedman wannabe, um, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, and I'm not sure that's uh, that's the that's the persona I want to project. Uh, um, however, there is a, a germ of an idea uh, behind uh, this title, um, maybe an idea and a half, uh, and uh, it actually, in some ways, encapsulates um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, quite nicely. And that is the notion that, um, that capitalism is, uh, is something that actually is uh, quite malleable, uh, is something that evolves over time, um, and that our, our conceptions of how capitalism works and how to uh, uh, make it work have also evolved over time. And further, the notion with the 3.0 is that uh, I think we're at a juncture currently where um, it's, uh, it's our responsibility to, um, to try to imagine uh, what the next stage of, of capitalism uh, at the global scale, um, a capitalism that's compatible with the kind of globalization we want to have, what that kind of capitalism might actually uh, look like. In other words, we need um, to apply a certain amount of institutional imagination uh, to, to uh, rethink uh, capitalism. And, and in, in some small way, I hope that I will be uh, contributing uh, to that debate uh, through, um, through some of the ideas that I'm going to be um, <coughs> talking about uh, uh, um, uh, here uh, in front of you tonight. Um, let me just go very uh, quickly over a very, very crude um, sort of uh, history of the ideas. And, and this is a Tom Friedman-esque history of capitalism. Um, capitalism 1.1, uh, was really about, at least sort of as an intellectual justification, was based really on the notion that, uh, that, that um, you know, capitalism was a wonderful way to unleash the economic energies of, of humanity. Uh, it's really, capitalism 1.0 is really a story about the miracle of markets. Um, and the central insight and I think it's an insight that uh, has survived um, the many uh, uh, changes in capitalism. It's, it's an insight that we should never lose sight of, is that the market uh, is indeed the most creative and dynamic economic engine known to men, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's sort of the, the, the heart of, 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 of at the very heart of capitalism. Now, Cap the earliest um, conceptions of capitalism, actually, historically, that is not true, uh, because uh, if you look at, if you read Adam Smith, clearly Adam Smith had a much more elaborate view of uh, what the role of the state in market societies had to be. Uh, but um, it, a certain view took hold, uh, certainly under classical liberalism in 19th century Britain and, and elsewhere where those ideas spread, and um, it's, it's reflected today in some of the sort of introductory economics textbook renditions of how markets work. It's also reflected today in a very strong libertarian tradition in the United States. Uh, 
and all of, wh all of which uh, essentially say that markets, uh, these wonderful things that we have, actually require a, a rather minimal kind of estate, uh, the, the sort of um, um, uh, the so-called the, the, the um, night watchman uh, kind of estate, where all that the government has to do is really provide from some essentials like the national defense, uh, protection of property rights, uh, and administer justice, um, and, uh, and that capitalism markets would take care of themselves. Um, uh, I think the what I would call capitalism 2.0, which is a somewhat a, a qualitatively different vision of, of, of capitalism, uh, is um, a vision of capitalism that married the notion that markets are these uh, wonderful ways of unleashing the economic energies of, of humanity with the notion that you really need, if you want markets to work well and if you want markets to become healthy and sustainable, that you need a set of institutional underpinnings that go way beyond um, that thin layer of, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, of, of functions uh, that the state performs in that mythical capitalism 1.0. And the, and the central insight I would associate with this second conceptualization of capitalism is in fact that markets cannot be standalone. Um, and markets cannot be standalone because when you think about it, markets do not create themselves, they're not self-creating, uh, they do not regulate themselves. We have now learned uh, that lesson um, uh, in, in a bitter way in, in financial markets. Um, uh, markets do not stabilize themselves and we know that at least since from the work from Keynes, uh, which um, has once, of course, once again of course become highly relevant. And more broadly, uh, markets do not legitimize themselves because if markets are going to uh, be sustainable, they need to uh, deliver uh, distributional outcomes that are going to be broadly consistent with what society at large is, is willing to live with. And therefore, you need legitimizing institutions um, to ensure that, that, that markets are accepted. And that is, in a nutshell, the reason why uh, markets need to be embedded, I think that's the key term, embedded, uh, in a wide range of non-market institutions. Uh, so you have um, uh, regulatory institutions, everything from consumer protection to antitrust to financial regulation uh, to redistributive institutions um, uh, to monetary and fiscal institutions to help stabilize um, 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 uh, market economies. And of course, a wide range of institutions of conflict management, um, w among which democratic governance is probably um, uh, uh, the, key, the key component. Um, in practice, I think the, uh, the, the application of these set of ideas uh, probably came uh, to fruition in the, um, in the aftermath uh, of the Second World War. Um, and it took essentially the form of the application of Keynesian macroeconomic policies together with the erection of um, uh, large um, and systematic welfare states um, in, in, um, in, 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 in Western Europe, uh, and a thinner, a somewhat thinner version of that also um, uh, uh, w uh, became practiced in the United States as well. Now, from our perspective, um, uh, the key weakness, the key um, uh, problem with uh, this version of capitalism is that in its conception and in the way that I've just put it, it's actually a national system and it's not a global one. Um, and the way in which the global economy under the uh, in the, during the first few decades of um, uh, the post-Second World War period, the manner in which the world economy adjusted itself to the fact that this version of capitalism is essentially a national, a nation-state-based version of capitalism, is by actually um, erecting a, a system of globalization, which was what I would call a system of a very shallow integration a very thin layer of globalization, essentially what the Bretton Woods regime did um, with the kinds of sort of uh, the initial set of arrangements under the IMF and the initial set of arrangements under the GATT, uh, what the Bretton Woods regime did was essentially throw a whole lot of sand, a whole lot of frictions 
into the, uh, into the international economic system to ensure that international trade and finance and international investment actually did not impinge to any great extent on these national systems of, of capitalism 2.0. Um, so in, with respect to uh, uh, international finance, of course, um, during this long period of post-Second World War period, um, you had capital controls uh, everywhere, uh, including in the advanced countries, which weren't really dismantled until, until the end of the uh, 1970s, um, which allowed these countries um, to uh, essentially pursue macroeconomic policies that uh, had a significant degree of autonomy from, from each other. And in the trade regime, when you look at, even though we talk about the, um, uh, the, the Bretton Woods regime as one in which there was significant amount of trade liberalization that took place, if you actually look at the liberalization, it essentially consisted of the removal of quantitative restrictions on just part of international trade. It was just that part of international trade that corresponded to the imports of the advanced developed countries. And even amongst them, pretty soon, textiles and clothing were carved out as an exception under the uh, multi-fiber arrangement. And essentially, developing countries as a whole were left outside the rules of the system. And the developed countries themselves, for a large part of their trade, which included trade in services or agriculture or textiles and clothing, um, they had essentially free room to do whatever they wanted. Um, and even in that part of trade, which came under the discipline of the GATT, uh, of course, they had um, escape clause, safeguard action, anti-dumping. And if, perchance, a trade partner brought a case against a country in the GATT and won, uh, according to the rules of the game, it was perfectly legitimate for the country that lost to actually veto the decision so that the, the GATT could never actually accept uh, that decision because you needed unanimity uh, for um, uh, this, that GATT um, uh, jurisprudence to, to, have, uh, to have effect. So it's important to realize how shallow uh, the instruments of integration, how thin this model of integration was in the, the Bretton Woods regime. Um, which is, I think, key to, um, is a key complement to the, to the national nature of, of the systems of capitalism in that period. Now, of course, all that began to change um, in the 1980s. And um, fundamentally, I think, with the expansion of uh, financial globalization, which we can date sort of from the beginnings from around 1990, um, and a different system, um, began to take shape, call this again uh, two point, capitalism 2.1, um, a, a system that um, it, it did not um, obey the, uh, the limitations or the restrictions of the previous, um, uh, previous regime. Um, I think the, what drove uh, the changes uh, from the late 80s, early 1990s on, was what I would call you know, two uh, neoliberal blind spots. Uh, so neoliberal is in quotation marks. So basically here, the neoliberal is person you're happy to disagree with. And uh, because it's in, it's, in, it's in quotation marks, so it's for you to define who a ne neoliberal is. But there were two key ideas, uh, to some extent, uh, that are still with us. And I think um, the, the, these intellectual errors uh, which had significant uh, practical consequence were that one, um, the idea that you could keep on pushing integration uh, in world trade and finance, move away, move further and deeper uh, from that shallow Bretton Woods model of integration into a much deeper model of trade and integration, um, and let the institutional underpinnings of that catch up later. Um, even if this wasn't explicitly stated as such, it was implicit that you could essentially pursue an agenda of deep integration in the World Trade Organization and deep financial globalization through other instruments. Um, and uh, if there were problems with the regulatory, redistributive, and all the other arrangements that you need in order to, uh, to make that system work, uh, essentially that was never an argument 
uh, for slowing down the pace of, of, of economic integration. And the second idea was that uh, deep economic integration has either no effects or when it does have effects, mostly benign effects on these national institutional arrangements. So the idea was that if you get tax competition in a system like this, well, that's good. That means that high taxes will be driven down to low, and what could be better than that? Uh, if you have institutional competition through regulatory arbitrage, what could be bad in that? It means that uh, good, regula good regulation will drive out bad regulation. Good institutions will drive out bad institutions. This idea was applied in particular to the developing countries where it was taken for granted that developing countries have across the board bad institutions. So if those institutions came under pressure from the process of trade and finance, all the better. Um, so uh, the, w this, uh, this effort um, found reflection in uh, a policy agenda um, a dual policy agenda uh, in the area of finance, in financial globalization, and in the area of trade uh, with a, uh, an agenda of deep integration uh, um, that a process that really first started with the Uruguay round, um, where, which not only created the World Trade Organization, but started um, to impose disciplines on countries that went significantly beyond what the domain of trade agreements had been in the past, which is to start to reach now into uh, policies and institutional arrangements beyond the border. So it was no longer just import tariffs and quotas, uh, but now you, can, you would negotiate things about quotas, I'm sorry, you would negotiate things about domestic subsidies, about domestic content regimes, about in, in intellectual property rights, um, and of course now it's about uh, agricultural um, uh, incentives and agricultural mm -hmm. regimes. Um, I think the results and the reason why um, I think uh, this version of, of capitalism uh, was unstable and um, didn't uh, 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 do very well uh, for us is that um, I think in the area of fi finance, it essentially is responsible for um, the financial crisis. But I think let's not forget that it also created um, the uh, process of steady erosion of the legitimacy of the trade system, which is, a, 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 which is a, you know, when, when things go wrong in trade, uh, things don't blow up in our face the same way that they do in finance. But I think um, there has been a very similar analogous parallel process in the trade regime uh, that has significantly weakened the legitimacy of the trade system. Um, and um, uh, and, and uh, this, this has created a problem where uh, the the agenda of the WTO is reflected in the current um, sort of uncompleted uh, um, Doha round. Uh, both has become uh, rather delinked with um, the from the issues that really matter, and also has become uh, 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 delegitimized because it, it's 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 clearly not responding to what a lot of people actually want the trade regime uh, to be doing. And as for the financial crisis, I think. Uh, the financial crisis fundamentally is rooted uh, in, in two things, um, in two complementary developments. One was um, the uh, willingness to let financial liberalization and financial innovation outstrip the ability of regulators and supervisors to keep track of what was going on. That is weakness in financial regulation. That's in some sense a, a problem with the uh, capitalism 2.0 version. In, in practice, and, it, and together with that, uh, it also um, reflect, it, it was also caused by um, a, a growing set of global macroeconomic imbalances um, reflected uh, best in the US-China uh, trade imbalance, uh, which at its bottom is really, um, is really the result of a mismanagement of the interface between two very different economic systems, two, if you will, two very different systems of national capitalism, the US one and the Chinese one. With the US one happy to let consumers uh, 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 go on a borrowing binge um, and, and, and the Chinese um, happy to go on a, I guess, a saving binge uh, and um, um, uh, uh, incentivize supply and production rather than, than consumption. Um, 
where does this leave us? Uh, this leaves us uh, with a problem, um, which I think is, is very uh, commonly presented and, and is, is, is widely understood today, uh, which is that um, what we face at present is a fundamental imbalance uh, between markets and their governance. Uh, in the purely national version of capitalism, capitalism 2.0, uh, markets were, in principle, coterminous with the institutions that underpin them. But now what we have are markets that are trying to be global, that are, their, their, their scope is global, yet their systems of governance are mostly national. Uh, there is this imbalance, there's a fundamental tension uh, between that. So the question uh, that arises is, is what will the, the next stage uh, look like? Um, uh, where do we want to where do we want to go now the temptation here uh, is to simply analogize from capitalism 2.0 and to want to recast that second version of capitalism on a global scale um, so what you say is that if the problem is uh, an imbalance between the reach of markets and the scope of uh, the institutions uh, within which those markets are embedded why don't we now recreate, reestablish that balance on a global scale? Think about what that would imply for a second. It would imply essentially that if we want a truly world system of trade, truly deep integration in trade, truly deep integration in finance and investment, what it means is that all those institutions that we previously thought of as being nationally based, now we have to reconfigure them as global institutions. So we need to have a global regulator that's going to take care of finance, we're going to have global systems of macroeconomic management, uh, a global lender of last resort, uh, we'll have a, a global system of redistribution when some parts of the world economy does poorly, and of course we need to think about the politics of that, which means that, you know, how will we democratically govern these set of institutions at the global level. Now, as soon as I've said that, as soon as I've said that, it should become clear that this is a deeply impractical agenda, um, that it's anything like this, uh, any attempt at trying to erect a system of this kind is going to place way too much faith on uh, what's missing, which is supply of a lot of global leadership, and together with that, uh, willingness of countries to essentially give up sovereignty. For good or ill, uh, we live in a world that's politically fragmented, uh, that's organized along nation states, with bits of exception here and there. So the European Union is obviously um, an exception here, in the sense that the European Union has built union-wide institutions in the European, Common, uh, European Court of Justice, the, um, um, the, uh, uh, for many of them, the a common monetary, um, uh, a common monetary uh, 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 area. Uh, some common fiscal rules, uh, and 100,000 pages plus, the last time I looked, uh, pages of regulation and directives on the acquis communautaire, right? What does that reflect? It just reflects a, essentially an attempt to build within the Europe uh, a version of this regional type of, of capitalism. But the moment, of course, I mentioned that, we also know all the difficulties that Europe is going through. Just look at the discussions right now on financial regulation and how Britain is saying that it doesn't want to be part of a European system of financial regulation and want to keep its own national uh, prerogatives in that area. So even within a set of countries with sort of, you know, like-minded, that are like-minded, um, uh, you have these very difficult um, task of, of trying to establish um, uh, these common institutional um, uh, underpinnings. But my main objection, now this objection about impracticality um, is not an objection of principle, but I also have a principled objection to this, uh, which is that that particular conception of capitalism would not necessarily be desirable. That in fact, the problem with this is just not, not just that it's hard to imagine how we, will really going, how we are really going to get a global financial regulator or truly global system of financial supervision. It's also that, it's, even if we could do that, 
it's unlikely that that would be desirable in and of itself. So my more principled, my substantive objection to this is based on the undesirability of this notion of institutional harmonization, institu institutional convergence, institutional um, uh, uh, construction uh, at the global level. And uh, the reason for that, I think, is that we live in a heterogeneous world. We live in a heterogeneous world where uh, different political communities are organized with um, somewhat different sets of prefer preferences and norms. Um, and furthermore, that depending on where they stand um, uh, uh, in the development process, that they may have very different kinds of needs in terms of um, the type of institutions that they need to have. So if you take seriously the notion that either because of different preferences or because of different needs, that different countries, different parts of the world have to have different types of institutional arrangements, uh, then it's no longer clear at all uh, that you want to build this version of capitalism on the idea um, that, 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 uh, that you want to carry um, institutional harmonization all the way up uh, to the global level. So uh, I want to just give you a, a little bit of a sense of, of exactly where these issues arise in terms of how exactly an agenda of deep economic globalization starts to impinge on um, different countries' needs or preferences for different institutional arrangements. So I'm just going to run, uh, uh, you know, and, and you're familiar with these kinds of examples, um, and I just, so I'm going to run through these uh, rather quickly just to be illustrative and, and to give some content or some concreteness to this notion that, uh, that there are in fact diverse national preferences and needs and therefore diverse institutional arrangements and um, getting rid of that diversity would not be something that would be inherently desirable. Um, take for example uh, a much debated area uh, which is the, the area of labor standards. Um, the question here is how should a country, uh, let's say an advanced country, a developed country, um, treat imports from developing countries uh, where labor standards might be very, very different. Uh, in particular, these labor standards might uh, involve um, uh, employing uh, uh, child workers, it might Im involve um, uh, having workers work um, excessively long hours, it might involve having workers work under uh, workplace conditions that would be considered very hazardous in the developed country. Now, leave aside the question of um, the, the, uh, the well-being of the exporting country, but look at it from the standpoint of the employment relationships or the labor market institutions in the importing country. In the importing country, we have established um, through history and through the development of labor market institutions, in at least many of them or most of them, the principle, for example, that it's not legitimate uh, for an employer to impose a harm on his or her workers by laying off those workers and hiring other workers, hiring other domestic workers um, who accept to work under work conditions that violate that country's, that country's um, labor laws, labor standards. So concrete examples, suppose that you have a you know, manufacturing facility you dismiss all your workers and then you hire a bunch of workers who accept to work 12 hour days, shifts, accept to work in, um, in, in, uh, in, in extremely hazardous conditions. Um, in other words, in conditions that explicitly violate that country's labor laws. Now this would be illegal. It would also be morally, I think most of us would consider that morally legitimate. Now if you're a libertarian, you would see nothing wrong with that, of course, because you would say it would be a bargain contract freely struck uh, between the employer and this new set of workers. But I think most of us would say that this is not how we envisage um, sort of our, our, our institutions, um, uh, this is not how we want our institutions to work. Now, I ask you, what's the difference between this employer undermining domestic regulatory standards, domestic labor market institutions, by hiring domestic workers that are willing to work under subpar conditions, and this employer essentially doing the same by hiring workers abroad. 
The effect is exactly the same in terms of what it does to eroding domestic standards and the harm that it imposes on the workers that are displaced as a consequence. And yet, it's funny, uh, or at least a little bit inconsistent, that we draw a very sharp line that says what the domestic employer is prohibited from doing in the domestic context is actually perfectly legal and acceptable and should not be interfered with in the context of international outsourcing or international trade. Okay? I'm not saying that the, res the, the, the way that we should respond to that is um, to ban trade of that kind. I think there are many difficult questions uh, arise in this. All that I'm saying is that we should understand the objections and the, um, uh, the set of values or the set of, 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 of accepted institutional norms that get threatened um, when trade like this happen. And it's not purely about uh, redistribution, it's also about a sense of how the rules are being changed or are being pressured to change by this kind of trade. And yet we have no good way of even talking about this. Um, there are many other examples um, of this. Uh, of course, we can ask questions about environment, health, or, or safety standards in various areas, and ask the question, what happens if some countries want to have higher standards in these areas, let's say in, uh, in, 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 with respect to um, uh, safety uh, on, the ba on the basis of precautionary standards than other countries? Um, should we say that these, kind, these kind of standards need to converge? Um, a different area, but conceptually quite analogous, is the issue of regulatory spillovers. Um, should you be forced to allow free trade in financial assets, or for that matter, toys, from countries that may not be doing a good job of uh, regulating how those financial assets or how those toys are produced, and therefore might cause you harm when you import them? Okay? On the other hand, if you're going to interfere in the border, then of course you're, you are uh, creating problems for trade. There are many uh, more uh, examples of that kind, um, and I think what I'm trying to uh, um, highlight here is this sort of try to be, uh, try to give a little bit more content to this notion of how, uh, given these differences in institutional arrangements um, across the world, how in fact uh, um, a, a system uh, of deep integration which says that we should minimize transactions costs at the border, how that becomes um, uh, quite problematic in, in a lot of different uh, uh, areas. Um, I think there are many other uh, examples, with particularly uh, um, from the developing world, uh, where uh, there are tensions uh, with uh, what deep integration would require and uh, the kind of institutional needs that developing countries might have. Um, and um, we can draw these from the areas of the trade regime, from international capital markets, uh, uh, various um, uh, um, standards or practices, except the sort of best practices in the areas of monetary policy. And of course, going even beyond that in, in a series of free trade agreements or, or bilateral investment treaties um, that developed countries have been, um, have been signing, uh, with countries in the developing world um, essentially progressively entail a narrowing um, of the kind of space uh, within which developing countries are able to engage in policies that are fundamental, are fundamental to their growth and development, which are these are policies that promote structural change and structural transformation whether these are policies um, of the type of industrial policy, uh, whether they're policies um, uh, that, uh, uh, that violate uh, intellectual property rights in, 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 in the way that those have been defined in, in the North, or they are monetary and currency exchange rate policies that don't fit in the, um, uh, in the um, uh, uh, sort of best practices um, uh, uh, understanding of, um, of free floating and, and central bank independence and inflation targeting. Uh, so there are, in fact, there are indeed uh, these tensions also for, um, for the developing countries. So um, let me, what I want to do next is try to uh, um, articulate uh, what I think are some guidelines uh, that makes sense at least to me as we think about uh, what this, no, sorry again for this, capitalism 3.0, uh, 
uh, would look like. Since I've argued that it, you know, the most sort of the easiest version of that, which is simply to take these institutions uh, up to um, the global level, it's neither practical nor, nor, uh, nor desirable. Um, so these are fairly general institutions, but I think they open, uh, open um, us, uh, they open sort of a, 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 a different way of thinking about institutional arrangements uh, that would support globalization. Uh, and then, then we're used to thinking of. And I think that's exactly the area of debate and discussion that I want to open up. Um, the first principle, which really carries over straight uh, from Capitalism 2.0, is simply a reiteration. And I think it's important to keep saying this because economists in particular are, are, are prone to forget it, uh, which is that markets need to be deeply embedded, deeply embedded in systems of governance uh, in, in order to work well in ways that, that I've described. So this is nothing new or surprising here. The second is just a statement uh, uh, of, of, of the ob obvious, uh, which is that uh, in today's world, democratic governance and the political communities that go with that are organized largely uh, with nations, within nation states and are likely to remain so in the immediate future. And uh, there are really very, very few exceptions to that. And, and again, the, the, the troubles, uh, the travails of, of the European Union in this domain with trying to build um, some kind of, of, of uh, community-wide politics and the ongoing discussion about the democratic deficit in the EU and so forth really points to um, the, the difficulty of, of, of doing this even at the, at the regional level. The third point uh, is, uh, to understand um, that these institutional differences exist often for very good reasons. In other words, there is no one way um, that institutional designs, these institutional underpinnings of market economies uh, will differ uh, according to domestic preferences and needs. Uh, developing countries will need to have different institutions than the developed countries while they remain developed and even the developed countries, if you look at the among developing countries, um, you find uh, in the areas of things like uh, welfare state arrangements or labor market institutions, and until recently, even in areas such as corporate governance, um, uh, 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 quite significant differences um, in institutional arrangements in, within the advanced countries as well, and, and you know, sort of sometimes this this um, gets discussed in terms of the, the difference between an Anglo-American model of capitalism versus a, uh, a continental model within Europe. Of course, there's the uh, uh, more the corporatist model and, and, um, and, 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 some, and others and so forth. Um, there's no, really no reason to believe that any one of these is essentially or inherently superior to any other. Um, in fact, every decade almost, there has been sort of a set of ideal uh, set of institutions that we focus on and then you know, something happens and then we move on to a second set of you know, ideal model. You remember the time when Japan, the Japanese miracle, we all thought that uh, Japanese institutions were the way to go. Um, uh, the, the fourth I think is fundamental and here is really where I'm, I'm you know, really forcing in some ways, um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know about how you react to this, but m most of my economist colleagues uh, sort of, you know, have to stop and, and, and take a big gulp, uh, you know, here uh, when I say this. Um, but I'm not going to mince any word. Countries have the right to protect their own social arrangements and institutions. Essentially, if these are the underpinnings of the way that their societies, their um, uh, economies work, I think along with that comes with the notion that um, that, that you have the right to protect these, uh, these arrangements. But, and I think it's important to make a conceptual distinction, although sometimes in practice uh, making the practical distinction might be much harder. Even though you have a right to impose, uh, to, to protect your own social arrangements, you don't have a right to impose it on others. Uh, so uh, if you're worried about the effect that labor market practices or, um, or, 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 or product safety rules in China are having on, um, uh, on, on institutions in your country, um, 
uh, you're allowed to do things that's going to prevent that adverse effect, but you're not allowed to then turn around and say, um, the way to handle this is to ask China um, to have exactly my kind of institutions. Um, I think that's a, that's, a fundamental, that's a fundamental difference. And where this leads me to is, is this, um, uh, the, the, the idea that, um, that when we think about how we design uh, globalization and its institutions is that um, we should think of this problem that we're solving um, uh, in, the pro in, 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 the, in, the, in the language of constrained uh, optimization as trying to attain the maximum thickness or the maximum depth of, uh, ec uh, of, of, of um, uh, uh, economic exchange uh, in trade, finance, and investment that is consistent with maintaining space for diversity in national uh, institutional arrangements. So the idea is that we do want to enable countries that are like-minded to want to deep integrate through institutional harmonization if they want to do so. So the path should be open for European Union uh, to go deeper uh, and to continue on the process of integration if they want to. If Asian countries want to take that uh, process through ASEAN, through the um, uh, Chiang Mai initiative, and, 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 and take it into uh, the direction of something like a, a, a um, East Asian and, and Southeast Asian Union, uh, they should be free to do so. Um, but when that kind of deep integration is not feasible or desirable, uh, we need to rely on traffic rules uh, they're going to manage the interface uh, among these diverse national institutional arrangements. Um, now, so what distinguishes, therefore, my conception of capitalism 3.0 um, is not a new version of capitalism. It's actually a system of interface of where of trying to think of how you can allow different models of capitalism to coexist with each other. Um, so that's a sense in which, in fact, my talk is really mistitled because what I'm talking about is really not a different model of capitalism at all. Um, I'm really simply talking about how we can make different, how, do we, how we can make existing capitalisms and their evolution coexist uh, peacefully. That's where the idea of these traffic rules and, 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 the, uh, and managing the interface um, uh, comes into play. Now, I'll make one last point uh, on this slide, uh, but, uh, but leave it there, uh, which is an important point, but uh, I'm not going to have much, much to say on this, which is that um, I think that non-democratic countries uh, pose, would pose special difficulties uh, for this architecture. Uh, since a lot of what I'm saying presumes the notion that countries get the institutional arrangements that they select, that in some sense those are reflect the choices of their citizenry. Of course, for non-democratic countries, you cannot take that for granted. There's no presumption uh, that institutional choices in non-democratic countries actually reflect the needs or the preferences of their citizenry. And therefore, when we think about how this institutional architecture would uh, would incorporate um, non-democratic countries, I do think we, will need to, we would need to actually have the logic of this is that actually we would need to have a different set of rules, the rules that might be a lot less permissive for non-democratic countries, and in fact, in, 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 in particular instances, may need to reverse the burden of proof uh, for non-democratic countries compared to the democratic countries. So um, we may want to come back and talk a little bit about that later on. Um, so uh, clearly, you know, one important and fundamental idea here is the notion of these new traffic rules, uh, these rules to manage the interface between uh, national regulatory settings and social orders. And I think what those rules are meant to do is to create policy space, um, policy space for rich countries to provide social insurance uh, address concerns about labor, environmental health and safety consequences of trade, and shorten what one might call the chain of delegation uh, between institutions like World Trade Organization that are making decisions in Geneva uh, based on some arcane trade rules and the domestic electorates um, who um, uh, actually 
even though they have ratified those agreements, are now being faced by, by decisions or, 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 or rulings uh, that might be, um, that they haven't really bargained for. And for poor nations, I think the analogous notion is the need for policy space for them to uh, fashion the kind of po po policies that would position themselves better uh, through globalization, through economic restructuring. In fact, precisely the kind of policy space that China, China had historically, India had historically, South Korea and Taiwan had historically in order to undertake the kinds of developmental policies um, that, that, they, um, um, uh, that, that they employed. Um, I want to give, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of, of, of time and I've, I've, um, I do however want to give just very briefly uh, a, a, an idea that uh, a sense of a little, make it a little bit more concrete this notion of how this uh, uh, policy space might apply in practice. And I want to say that this is just an illustration of how you may want to think about uh, making something like this a reality. It actually builds on an existing principle um, from uh, GATT WTO practice, which is this notion of a WTO uh, safeguards. Uh, what does safeguards do? Uh, this is safe, what safeguards do is actually um, they allow countries to reimpose tariffs under certain circumstances. And the principle behind safeguards, interestingly, is exactly the same principle I want to broaden and apply uh, in a wider range of areas, which is the notion that um, negotiated opt-outs uh, with procedural constraints to ensure that it's not a free-for-all uh, are better than disorganized opt-outs, because if you constrain countries too much, uh, to do things that are going to run afoul of the kinds of things that are consistent with their preferences, then in fact what you're going to get is, is, is people will violate the rules anyhow. So it's just much better to build the exceptions into the rules and, and uh, give countries the space than force countries to actually uh, violate the rules because um, uh, there is no space. Um, now the, the, inter the interesting thing about safeguards in practice is actually they are restricted to a very limited set of circumstances. Uh, so there must exist a surge in imports. Uh, this surge of imports must be causally linked uh, to injury, quote unquote, to domestic industry. Um, the trade remedy, uh, that's the tariff uh, that the importing country imposes uh, in response to this injury, must be applied on a most favored nation basis. Uh, it must be temporary and the country that is, impo that is applying this remedy must provide compensation uh, to the exporting country. Um, what my proposal is is actually a very simple extension of this, which is simply to say uh, this is a wonderful principle, why don't we use it more broadly? Um, why don't we extend it and broaden it to a wider set of circumstances in which uh, the harm uh, that is entailed by trade is not simply a competitive harm on a particular industry that is injured through imports, import competition, uh, but um, the harm is imposed on, on the set of, 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 of norms or institutional arrangements that, um, that embody those norms in the importing country. Um, so we want to think about how we would apply that to a broader set of circumstances in which the legitimacy of trade might be at issue. And then to prevent um, the um, uh, uh, this kind of, of, of slippery slope of, of into protectionism, then we would subject these domestic procedures um, to certain principles of, of uh, certain disciplines, such as the, the need for transparency, for accountability, uh, for other institutional prerequisites, such as, very importantly, for example, to require that those interests that would be adversely affected by the imposition of trade must have standing in that procedure, uh, which is, a, of course, uh, uh, a principle that, that currently actually doesn't obtain uh, in, in sort of in a similar area, for example, in, 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 in anti-dumping procedures. Um, so what I have in mind is, is a kind of setting where if a particular set of, let's say, a consumer group uh, believes that trade with an exporting country um, is harmful, because the exporting countries, let's say, is using uh, 
a, a, a set of labor market practices that are wildly at variance with accepted norms in the importing country. Uh, under this principle, what they would call would be some safeguards, and then there would be a procedure whereby there would be a hearing or perhaps um, um, a, 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 a sort of um, 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 uh, a judicial process where views would be called for all parties, including, again, very importantly, views from groups that would actually be hurt if safeguards are applied. And the idea is to try to create a domestic debate, create a domestic discussion and deliberation about the various pros and cons of the trade remedy in question, and to, to, to discover through domestic deliberation the extent to which there is, in fact, a widely held norm that is in danger, or whether, in fact, what is happening is simply a bunch of college kids uh, who think that something very bad is happening, but you know, it's not actually either bad or it's not actually widely held by, by the public at large. Um, I think that's how it's proper to solve problems like this in a, in a democracy. Um, okay, uh, we can apply the same kind of ideas in, 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 in the area of finance, and I'm happy to talk about it if, if there are any, any questions, but I've, I've gone over my time, so let me just end uh, by some very uh, broad uh, remarks. Uh, I think obviously as we go forward, the worst thing that could happen is that we would be uh, returning to the 1930s. I think that's not very likely at all, uh, but I think we might be making a mistake of the opposite kind, which is simply, uh, maybe through lack of, of, of institutional imagination, believe that an ambitious effort to take economic globalization to the next level is the way to go. And I sense um, this kind of implicit view in a lot of the efforts uh, that underline current, uh, current um, uh, reform uh, 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 items on the agenda. As I've argued, I think this is uh, neither desirable nor, in fact, uh, practical. And what I've argued is for trying to you know, think like economists uh, that there are trade-offs and we don't want to go to a corner solution because a corner solution here is, in fact, in, 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 infeasible. And we want to return, uh, if you will, to not the actual practices of the Bretton Woods, but at least to the spirit of the Bretton Woods, which was much more cognizant of this need to fine-tune the management of the requirements of the international economy on the one hand and the legitimate uh, needs of, of individual uh, uh, nation states uh, on, on the other. Um, and I think a key element in creating that kind of architecture in ways that I've suggested would be to think of, of how we can create greater domestic policy space um, in ways that are not going to be injurious to, um, to global trade and investment in a major way, because I really believe that if we have good rules uh, that provide more policy space, um, somewhat paradoxically, we're going to have a better and more sustainable globalization than if we actually do the um, uh, follow on the agenda of trying to push it to the next stage uh, without the, uh, where in fact the institutional underpinnings are, 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 are way too fragile or, or indeed missing. So let me end here. I look forward to, to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Danny. Just before hands go up, I'm conscious that some people are in an overflow room. If there's a burning question from that room, maybe if you, one of you runs in with your hand up at the back, I will try and call you. Uh, but we'll kick off straight away with questions, and I'll try and take three. So if you could put up your hands, please. Microphone will, will come to you. I'll take one from each side. We'll start at the front here, please, if there's a microphone. Right in the front row, and then we'll go over on this side, and then to lady on the left. If you could just introduce yourself and keep it short. Thank you, Dr. Roderick, for your enlightening speech. Um, I just have a question about the underlying power structures of uh, what you think is, should be the new um, form of capitalism. Uh, what do you think, power, like, because, because uh, the first two versions of capitalism, as you described them, were like functions of underlying power structures, if you assume that. So what would the 
domestic and international power structures have to look li uh, like if we were to get there um, to capitalism 3.0. Uh, Thank you. Gentleman with the white shirt. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, my question um, relates to the distinction between the market environment and the non-market environment, which I think you've distinguished, you've, you've separated uh, quite strongly. And I think notwithstanding the resilience of the nation state, that, that division is blurring. And so there are lots of contexts in which corporations take an active role in governance, and that's uh, particularly in, in, in developing countries. I think that's it's quite an interesting context but also situations in which states uh, behave like firms. So I'm thinking of um, national oil companies, uh, a lot of uh, national champions being created around the world. In China, even provincial level state-owned companies are being created. I mean, it, it is a, it, quite a significant new trend. And of course, sovereign wealth funds. And I think the, the complexity introduced by, you know, kind of market actors behaving like non-market actors and, and the other way around has some implications for the effectiveness of, the, of your proposals and of these safeguards. I wonder what your comments would be. Thank you. Uh, fifth row back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is about uh, deep integration, and um, I think there is quite a bit of policy space um, in the WTO still, and the real sort of pernicious uh, move towards deep integration has happened, um, as you said, in the BITS and the FTAs and the regional and bilateral agreements. But these decisions are being made on a national level, and countries are very often uh, ve willing to trade away deep integration for market access and for um, basically for what was shallow integration. So I wonder this national framework um, itself is pushing deep integration and then are there any solutions to that? How to shift it away? I'll let Danny answer and then we'll sort of move further back. Okay, um, great questions. I'll, I'll just, um, I, I mean, there are lots of questions. So let, let me let me do this. Let me just ac acknowledge the uh, the the importance of the issues that 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 lie behind uh, each one of these questions. I know you're all trying to sort of be responsive to the steward and just you know ask the question. But I understand there's lots behind these questions, and and uh, and I'm hearing those. And if, even if I don't get all of it, so I'm getting some of it. So and and I'm no, and I thank you for that. Um, so in that sense, I'm not going to try to respond in detail to everything. Uh, but to maybe just telegraph some some quick reactions. Um, I, you know, it's um, I have I have one question was what's the underlying power structure that's going to go with capitalism 3.0? Um, you know, I'm you know you you might think it's it's going to be unfair that now I'm going to ret retreat into being an economist and say you know you know I'm I'm just an economist I don't know, uh, but of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, obviously, I'm dealing with things that that go beyond that. I mean, I'm, you know, what? Let me. I, I'm just going to do, do, to say this. I think there's a tendency, and I'm not saying that that's what was reflected in the question, um, to uh, shoehorn outcomes um, too tightly into sort of you know the power structure. And I think the power structure often doesn't know what it wants. Uh, so, you know, it's not like the power structure has the idea of what is it that you want to get and then goes for it. And then if you want something different, you better think of a power structure, otherwise you're not going to get it. I think oftentimes the power structure has no clue. Um, and if you can convince them, so this is where I think, you know, ideas and intellectual um, uh, uh, um, contributions can really make a huge difference by simply telling, you know, those power structures, that there are multiple ways in which they can attain those objectives, and some are better than others. And uh, yes, uh, you know, you're never going to do something that's going to be truly, truly harmful to the United States in the current environment. And two years ago, you would not have been able to do anything that was going to be truly, truly harmful to financial interests in the United States. Uh, but I, I think um, everything that I'm suggesting here are things that are going to be beneficial to them as well. Um, so it's, it's, 
you know, is, 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 is trying to get people to understand that, that, that some of the outcomes may not be uh, what, what they thought. So, of course, it's, it's, I'm being very, uh, you know, uh, overly facetious here. You know, power does matter and all of that. But, but do consider also the notion that, you know, it's, it's uh, you, know, uh, you know, powerful people know what they want in the sense that they want to maintain their power and they want to win, maintain their wealth. Uh, but it's not, you know, running the system down is not the best way to do that if, if that's, the, that's the course that they're following, right? So uh, I think that's where there is rule for, for the rest of us and for society and, and, and not, you know, technocrats, political leaders to find ways of reconceptualizing actually what powerful people work and, and want and, 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 and creating new stakeholders and new alliances in ways that you know, uh, will, uh, you know, enable you to, to, uh, to, to achieve different outcomes that may not have seen uh, feasible with the, within the existing power structure. I'm very sensitive to the question about sort of this, you know, intermediate forms of, of, of governance and the difference between that these, you know, markets and non-state markets are, 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 are fusing. And I, I, I do realize that in my presentation, I, I'm giving a very, very stark dichotomy. And so it's, it's the state, the government, the nation state is still the main actor. I would say, and I'm willing to debate this, uh, you know, probably you know, won't have time to do it here, that we overestimate in, in practice how much of that diffusion of power has actually taken place. I would say that the, the real actors still remain national governments. Um, and I, I think that multinational enterprises and others that are not involved in, in sort of you know, corporate social responsibility and all of that are still playing very, very largely by a set of rules that are um, um, uh, 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 written by um, uh, national governments. And, and they still, that's the main thing that determines the environment in which they work. Uh, but have they become more important? Does that create you know, other issues? Absolutely. But, but I don't, I guess you can easily uh, contrast my perspective with one that says we're in a different world where nation, national states don't matter anymore and it's now all this network governance and, and that's the way to think about it. And that's clearly what I, where, where I'm not at. And that's clearly where I don't think is a helpful way of looking at it. But I haven't talked about in great detail uh, about uh, uh, reasons why I think that. Um, I think the question about why countries, in fact, are themselves willing buying into uh, deep integration is a, is a real good question. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think you know, obviously, if you have uh, uh, you know uh, a regional agreement being signed, you know, you need both sides to be willing to do that, and, and often as in the case of the U.S. and various uh, uh, regional agreements with Latin America and elsewhere, or the per, you know, EU with its sort of, uh, peripheral uh, countries. It's the other countries that want the agreement more than. Um, and I, I, I think um, it's a complicated sort of issue. Some of it is, I think, is sort of a domino effect. I think there's, there's the issue that, that everybody's doing it, and so it's not really that. Um, and uh, others, um, I think, have to do with um, you know, a bit of false consciousness. I mean, I think that, that uh, about, you know, having a, you know, a false sense of, of where your interests are. Um, uh, I know that's a little bit inconsistent with a lot of what I've said before, but never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, And, and, and the other thing, again, it, it ties in with what I said in the answer to the, to the, answer to the first question. Um, I mean, the intellectual environment, which tells these countries that the way to go forward is to actually to, to get into these agreements, you know, that's the intellectual framework. And I think they're being responsive to that. And that's, you know, in part what I'm, what I'm hoping that opening up this debate does. It actually does also open up the intellectual framework to sort of alternative ways of thinking about how this is done. Um, so, uh, you know, in that way, I think this would be a contribution um, uh, um, uh, to that. But you're right that I, you know, sometimes I, I, I get heard as saying that this is all these things are being imposed on developing countries, and that's absolutely not true. Okay, I, I'm going to now share the power of. Uh informal and asymmetrical power bargains because three of my colleagues have 
caught my eye, so I'm going to go to Mary Calder, Kate Maher, and Danny Qua. Then I will go to the back of the room. So they're all in the they're all in the third row, please. So Mary, then Kate, then Danny. Yeah, well, thank you for a wonderful lecture, and I'm hugely sympathetic to this idea of coming back to the spirit of Bretton Woods and your very clever idea of new traffic rules. But I did miss two things. One's already been mentioned, which is power relations. I'm not as convinced as you that capitalism, too, was based on national sovereignty. I think it was based on the global leadership of the United States. You know, the Federal Reserve was the world's bank. <laughs> And actually, this crisis is all about the crisis, I think, of American power. Uh, so I do think we have to think about power structures if we're going to try and introduce new traffic rules. The other is technology, uh, which you didn't mention. I think um, capitalism, too, was very much based on territorially based manufacturing. In capitalism three, we're in an information technology age, a weightless economy, where it's actually going to be very difficult to protect economies, either economically or politically. You know, this domestic policy space that you talk about is already a globalized policy space. So I'm wondering how that will operate too, and not to mention how it will, what it will mean for trade rules and so on, and how difficult it will be. Thanks, Mary. Could you just pass it along to Kate? Yes, I, I too would like to thank you for a very refreshing take on uh, economic policy uh, decisions at the global level. Um, but I'm wondering about the civil end of this power dispensation in which this kind of capital 3.0 would take place. I'm impressed by your faith in the representativeness of domestic policy decisions, especially in democracies. But I'm not really convinced, that, again, that things really work that way. Um, if we look at the realities of the situation, even in the developing world, in the, the major democracies, where G8 meetings are, are taken, uh, take place in situations where they insulate themselves from the opinions and the concerns of citizens, um, and the context of this financial crisis, where we have a major bailout and a series of decisions taken at such a level that most citizens don't realize what's happening, when it's happening, and by the time it's all over, <coughs> bankers have preserved their six, seven-digit bonuses and uh, pensions, and citizens are being told that they have to uh, cut back on um, access to social services, education, health care is to be cut, um, university lecturers and teachers are going to be fired. And I'm wondering how... <laughs> Just to take a completely random example. <laughs> I'm wondering how, in the light of this kind of political context, we get the kind of legitimacy that you're talking about in your Capitalism 3.0. Danny. Um, Danny Kua, Economics Department. Again, thanks, Danny, for an excellent lecture. I wonder if I can apply the framework, magisterial framework, that you've provided us to two specific examples. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. In the specific examples, there are, only t they, they are only two, but I don't think they are minor. The first of these is um, the issue of your, your, co the co your comments about democracies and policy space. If I apply that to, say, the trade that China engages in, we know that China actually trades double the amount with East and Southeast Asia than it does with the United States. Um, the trade balances that it enjoys with each of these countries that are by, by no stretch of the imagination, Western imagination, democratic. It's difficult to think about global imbalances arising in that kind of situation that would lead to the kind of crisis that we've seen unfold over the last 18 months. So the first example, Chinese trade with East Asia, what's different there from the, the Chinese trade that you've described that has led to global macro imbalances? The second example, uh, again, has to do with your comments about democracy and policy space. Arguably, the most democratic country in the world is the United States. Arguably, the most powerful economy in the world is the United States. Um, but neither of these factors about the United States prevented, A, most of the economic growth occurring over the last 15 years in the US being quite divorced from benefits to the great majority of the American workforce. We know that 
for the median worker in the United States, re real incomes actually fell. Most of the wealth that was being generated accrued to a very tiny fraction of people who happened to work in the financial and banking sector. So even in arguably the most democratic economy in the world, we did not see an alignment of the impact, of the effects of trade, of, of globalization, and the benefits to the common population. In fact, if anything, it was you know, imports of cheap goods from the United States that benefited the US population the most. Then the final point, it is difficult to think that the US economy, of all economies, did not have the power to carve out a domestic policy space to keep off the brutal wave of globalization that was engulfing that economy. If any economy in the world had the power to cover a policy space over the United States, but nonetheless, it is in that economy that the current global financial crisis emerged. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are, are we going to have more questions like this? Yeah, but they're going to be shorter. <laughs> no, I mean... One more round. It's, it's, um, let me try to combine them in a way. Um, I mean, I, I think part of this goes to sort of this, this, this um, uh, you know, ongoing and endless debate on uh, ideas versus interests. And um, I think I, I take the arguments that say, look, it's, it's you know, the importance of power and, and uh, importance as, as essentially saying that, that things are determined by uh, by interests, even in democracies, and so regardless of you know whether you're a democracy or not, and regardless of how many countries there are in the world, the U.S. is the biggest one, and everything globally gets determined by what the U.S. wanted, and everything within the U.S. got determined by what financial interests wanted, even though it turns out to be very narrow, sort of short-term view of 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 how what would work for them. Um, and, and so these, all these other notions about you know, democracy you know, or, 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 you know, aren't going to carry that much weight. Um, uh, let me say two things. Um, one about one is I think that, again, it's, it goes back to the question that, that, I mean, the answer that I gave in, in the beginning, that I, I think I find explanations that are based mostly on interest to be highly incomplete. Because I think those interests, which interests get privileged in the policy space, has a lot to do which ideas are hegemonic, which ideas are dominant. And the fact that financial interests in the US got so dominant uh, was at least in part, can dis you know, discuss how important, but at least in part uh, because of a set of ideas that were promoted by economists and a set of, of, of a, you know, a, a zeitgeist that developed out of a notion of how a market economy works, you know, call it the Washington Consensus, call it, you know, whatever. Um, and, and that idea, you know, was pushed along because it served a bunch of interests. But the intellectual justification, the intellectual um, uh, um, grounding, it was invaluable, the service that economists provided for that agenda. Um, so, how much of it is ideas, how much of it is interest, I don't know. But I know that it's not just interest. I know that it's a, the, the policy that the United States pursues in the world economy and the policies that, that you know, particular groups in the United States are going to pursue are going to be shaped by this view of, of what's, what are the right ideas of the time. So my hope, and I might be completely wrong, is that by actually shaping and changing the set of ideas that you see are the valid ideas, you're actually able to slightly devalue the role of some interests um, uh, because they do not carry the same legitimacy in the policy sphere that they would otherwise, um, and, 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 sli and slightly change the manner in which powerful interests are going to be pursuing their own interests, um, both of which uh, sort of, um, you know, would be good. So again, I'm arguing for some, some policy, some space here for the role of ideas. Uh, because if you don't think ideas matter, then I'm really stuck. You know, why did you all come here? Um, you know, sort of. You know, it, it's not. You know, all of us sitting here are not going to change the power structure in the world. I mean, 
but you know, we might uh, all convince ourselves of the importance of certain set of ideas. I really believe that 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 makes a that that makes a difference, um, and. You know, I believe in the capacity of the United States to act for the good of the world. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, you know, I don't think they're out there to to screw the world. Um, you know, I I think the uh, I think the point that Kate made about um, you know, can we really believe in, in the legitimacy of some kind of, of of a process that's going to um, come out of this? What I'm trying to push is, is exactly. A form of, of of process that's going to endow this with certain degree of legitimacy. So you're right that actual decisions get determined in the way that you you, you described. But that's where globalization has gotten us into trouble. That's where, because precisely this chain of delegation has become longer and longer, the decisions that the G8 take or the decisions that are taken in the WTO dispute settlement don't carry any legitimacy um, on the part of of the domestic electorate. Um, and what I'm trying to do is say, is precisely try to think of institutions that are going to endow the process with certain degree of legitimacy. So when I, I'm talking about the safeguard process, uh, this expanded safeguard process, it's trying to force domestic deliberation over issues. Uh, it's by saying that, you know, it's not a bunch of technocrats or trade lawyers that are going to decide on whether a particular kind of trade is legitimate or not from the perspective of an individual country. Don't have, you know, I don't want Larry Summers to decide this, or I don't want, you know, Pascal Lamy to decide this. Um, and it might be idealistic, and because I'm an economist, I'm allowed to be idealistic in political matters. Um, I'm saying that, you know, these are highly political matters. They're, they're highly contested issues. The only way to think them through is by actually having a domestic deliberation. So you force the agenda, you, you force it to be deliberated domestically by saying that the only way in which you can impose a certain trade restriction in this area is by having a participatory process and a transparent process that calls all the relevant parties, whether they're consumer groups, they're import competing groups, they're exporting groups, um, to testify or to be part of that process to, 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 give, their, to, to give their views. And I believe that a process like this can really work because there are some egregious cases, for example, you know, trade made with slave uh, goods made with slave labor, where I have very difficult time imagining that in domestic interest groups that actually materially benefit from that kind of a trade would be able to stand in a public deliberative body and say this kind of trade is okay. Um, and for that matter, even in the WTO, trade based on prison labor is also illegal. So, but on the other hand, there are going to be many other cases, such as, uh, you know, you can imagine a domestic discussion in areas of child labor, where there's a genuine discussion to be had, whether, you know, on the one hand, you don't want your domestic workers to be harmed by labor practices elsewhere that might be considered abhorrent from a domestic perspective. On the other hand, there's a legitimate argument to be made that there will be big harm imposed on the exporting country and the child workers there because the alternative might be even worse. All these arguments. I'm trying to create, I'm, going to, I'm trying to force that discussion to actually take place. And it's not because I think democracy is some ideal thing. It's because I think that's the only way we can do that because what's the alternative? I don't know if I'm being responsive to your concerns, but. Very. I think if, if we've probably got time if we just go five minutes late to take three more questions from the back, if that's okay with you. Danny, did anybody come in from the it's okay, spillover room? okay, as long as they're not very good. <laughs> did anybody come in from the spillover room? Uh, in that case, we'll start right at the back. The gentleman there. Just on the issue of deregulation, if you had a rule of thumb for when and how governments should regulate markets, what would it be? Could you say it again? I couldn't, we couldn't quite hear it at the front. Sure. So if you, had a, if you could think of a, a rule of thumb for when policymakers should regulate markets and how they should go about it, what would that, what form would that take, what would that be? Did you get that? Yeah. Rule of thumb. Uh, one or two quick questions, yes, right in front of you in the pink. Thank you, Professor, for those uh, insights. It's really interesting to hear uh, a longer term view uh, relating to the recession and the crisis. Uh, my question relates to the safeguard process. Um, I'm 
I'm not convinced that advanced economies would buy into this process. Um, I'm wondering what your view on that is, and if you had one uh, key point to make um, in order to make the case for that process, what would it be? Um, one key point for developed countries buying into the process, what would it be? Is that right? I, I, yeah, I'm just not. I, I want. I'm not convinced that uh, advanced economies or Western economies would buy into. Um, your, the model that you're envis envisaging, and I'm wondering what case um, you would make to get them to buy into it. And yes, just the um, lady with a hand up, left hand up. This will be the last one, I think. Hi, yes, I also have a question in regards to the practicality of capitalism 3.0. And I'm curious as to know if, um, if we had had capitalism 3.0 as you envision um, prior to the crisis, how would it have prevented it? And if it wouldn't have, what's the point? <laughs> That's a good last question. Uh, uh, great, great question. Um, I, I, you know, I think my rules. Um, let me let me just say. You know, let me take them in order. Um, the uh, um, rule of thumb for regulating markets: there ain't any. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the. Um, um, how do you convince developed countries to, to buy into this? I don't know. <laughs> Help me out. Um, uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, um, I mean, I, I think the issue is, 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 you know, sort of there is a vacuum here for, for ideas. And, and um, um, you know, what I would hope most uh, to have is is we need to we need to we need we badly need to increase our institutional imagination and, and sort of the repertory of, of, of ideas that we have for the global economy because we really are running short of that and I think you know um, if we get that discussion going on um, you know I, I think and, and some kind of experimentation um, hopefully that um, you know that will move us in the right direction. Um, how would these ideas have, have uh, or, or would they have prevented the financial crisis? Uh, let me be clear that I mean these ideas don't prevent um, nations from uh, harming themselves. So as I said uh, maybe too briefly, the domestic the, the, the crisis, the, you know, the crisis was the confluence of two things, okay? Um, it was um, a, a errors in regulation and supervision combined with a global macroeconomic imbalance or, you know, what Bernanke called the liquidity glut, okay? Um, absent problems of supervision and regulation, macroeconomic imbalances on their own would not have co resulted in the blow up. Um, but absent um, the global macroeconomic imbalances, uh, the consequences of poor regulation and supervision would not have been nearly as big because the kind of leverage that the system built up would not have been um, as large. So you needed, it was the interactive effect of those two things which are responsible uh, for, for the crisis. Um, so, uh, I think at least, you know, to the, to the extent that there were problems in domestic financial regulation in the United States, um, it was a failure of capitalism 2.0. So nothing in what I'm saying would have prevented that from, from happening. Um, it was, you know, so that's what I mean by, you know, capitalism 3.0 is not going to, uh, you know, prevent countries from doing harm to themselves. And it's, it's hard to imagine um, how it, it, you know, you could imagine a system like that. Um, uh, but it would have, um, capitalism 3.0 would, uh, might have enabled to, uh, to prevent many of the spillovers. Uh, because even though I didn't have time to talk about the financial aspects of this, um, in capitalism 3.0, financial markets would be significantly more segmented, or at least more segmentable, uh, than they have been uh, in, 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 in the run-up to the crisis. So in a way, the spillovers, uh, to countries uh, that were, in some sense, innocent bystanders would be less severe uh, than what we've experienced. Thank you.
I know there are a number of other people that would like to ask questions, but I'm afraid that we're already over time. I would like to thank all of you who've come here tonight to listen to Professor Roderick, including those people in the overspill room, and thank you for your sharp, short questions. But most of all, we'd like to thank you, Danny, for sharing your thoughts on capitalism 3.0 with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.